Everybody. Welcome to Sunday Morning Podcast with Brother Mike. Welcome to HardcoreChristianity.com. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix. And thank you for tuning in today. I got another good one for you. Got another good one for you. My uh, youngest daughter, Tracy, who led me to the Lord many years ago, uh, she's spending the weekend with me and she's praying for the broadcast today. So I know this Bible study is going to go well. A couple of quick notes before we start into the Holy Word of God. Uh, Number one, please remember we have two live services every week at the Arizona Deliverance Center. We're downtown. Osborne. 15th Avenue in Osborne. And uh, both services start at 7 o'clock Thursday and Friday nights. We have uh, teaching, and then we have altar call with deliverance and healing. And the Holy Spirit shows up 100% of the time. He's never missed one service. Since I've been in the ministry, I started holding services in 2004 at uh, the uh, Maricopa County Jail. And then I went to the prisons in Arizona. I traveled all around the state going to prisons and uh, the Holy Ghost showed up in 90% of those services. Uh, Same thing at the Maricopa County Jail, 95% of the services, the Spirit of God moved. But at the Deliverance Center and the House of Healing, it's 100%. He moves at every single service, literally everyone. Uh, please remember, we have three Zoom services every week. You can send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the information, the code, and the password. Mondays is for the ladies, and then Wednesday and Saturday is for everybody. You can check the website, hardcorechristianity.com, or you can send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send it out immediately. Please remember to request the Miracle lists. I have two of them, one for mentally ill Christians, one for uh, troubled, tempted Christians. And uh, unless you do the miracle list, 
you will never be completely and totally free of demons. And if you want to be physically healed, the miracle list is your quickest and your shortest route to divine healing. I'll send it out to you immediately. I'll send it today if you send me an email. Mike at hardcorechristianity.com. And please remember our women's seminar coming up. Wow, Saturday. This thing is going to be amazing. The women's seminar is Saturday. Wow, it's going to be a special event. We got a bunch of people coming in from out of state for the seminar. And the altar call and the anointing is going to be boom. Like boom. Saturday, the women. Thank God for that. Temptation and trials. What in the what in the world is the story on those? What's the root of it? Everybody teaches on temptations. Everybody teaches on trials. But as far as I know, nobody ever went to the root of it. Well, let's go through it together and uh, give you some insights into this strange phenomenon. Christians being tempted and going through trials. Really weird. Weird concept. Hear the word of the Lord. Let's go to James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man or woman that endures temptation. Greek word, parismos. Parismos means to be put to the test of something. For example, if I would say I can spell Czechoslovakia, and you would want to parismos me. You would want to put me to the test. Okay. Mike, you said you could spell Czechoslovakia. Go ahead and spell it. That's what that Greek word means. Spell it. And then the, the word says, for when a person is tried, when a person is tried, he will receive the crown of life. Now, this Greek word for tried there is not the regular Greek word for try, tried. It's the Greek word dokimus. And it means approved. So what's Paul's, what's James saying here? It's clear. You're a blessed person if you're being put to the test or put to proof or being made to prove your faith. For when you are approved, you will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Greek word agapao. Now that's not the Greek noun agape. It's the Greek verb for love. That is agapao. It means to show love to someone. It means to activate your love. You may love someone, but that's not going to do them any good unless you show the love to them. Showing them love proves you love them. Not just saying you love them or not just actually love them because if somebody loves you, what good is that going to do to you? No, it doesn't do any good until they get that love to you. You got to get that love to you, right? That's what happened on your honeymoon. Remember when your honeymoon? Oh, on second thought, about half of you. Do you remember your honeymoon? The other half of your honeymoon was a nightmare. Remember the good honeymoon? Yeah, you were showing your love to your new spouse. See that? Agapao. So what, what James is saying here is, look. When you're put to test, when you're tested, when you're when you pass your test and you're accepted by God because you were victorious and you were an overcomer, you will receive the crown of life which God has promised to all those who show their love to him. Okay, let's go to verse 13 and break that one down. It says, "Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God." Okay, let no man say when he is tempted, he is, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Now, remember, in the Greek text, the subject of the verse is evil here. Greek word kakos, it means bad things, sinful things, evil things, wicked things. It says, when you are tempted, 
by evil or bad things, that is not God tempting you or testing you. It's not God testing you. It's demons testing you. And it says why here. It says, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither does he tempt or test any man. Now, we know that's not true because God tests people all the time. But he never uses evil to do it, is the point of the verse. So if something bad is happening to you, divorce, foreclosure, bankruptcy, kids on drugs, daughter pregnant, whatever it is, all that stuff's happening from demons. None of it is happening because God did it. God cannot be tempted with evil. What's the obvious concept of that? Hey, dear Lord Jesus, here I got you a gigantic vat of money. Here's a million dollars in cash. Here's a couple of hookers. Here's glory, honor, and praise of men. That make that has no effect whatsoever on God. God cannot be tempted with bad things, and he never tempts people or anyone else with bad things. It's not part of him. See, you can only give what you have. You can only give what you have. So for example, the Holy Spirit has nine features about his personality. In Galatians, it's called the fruit of the Spirit. And those nine features of his personality are all he has. He cannot give you resentment, covetousness, lies, because he doesn't have them. It's not that he chooses not to do it. It's that he doesn't have it to do it. It's impossible. It's impossible for God to give you something he does not have. Flip it over. In Galatians, uh, Paul goes through the lust of the flesh. And it's a big list, 18 things. Remember that? That's awesome. Unbelievable. Huge list of the lust of the flesh. Well, those don't, none of those come from God. All those come from demons. Why? Because the devil can't give you something he doesn't have. The nine fruits of the Spirit, he never gives that to anybody because he doesn't have it to give. The lust of the flesh, God never gives that to somebody because he doesn't have it to give. It's impossible for Satan to give you peace, hope, love, patience. He doesn't have it. It's impossible for God to give you lust, rage, anger, bitterness. He doesn't have it. He can't give you something he does not have. God cannot be tested or put to test by bad things because they have no effect on him. So the devil never tries to tempt God. Because it doesn't work. He knows it doesn't work. The only person it works on are human beings. But then verse 14 gets to the root of it. Here it is. When every man is tempted, right? Parazzo, tested, scrutinized. Every man is tested. When? They are drawn away. The Greek word for drawn away there, there is exalco. It means to drag. You know, for example, uh, if you dropped an anchor off the boat and you had to put it back in the boat, you would drag it out of the water, lift it up and dump it. You would tow another vehicle. A tow truck is dragging another vehicle out of a ditch. Every man is tested when they are being dragged. How? Out of their own lusts and enticed. Deliazo is a Greek word for enticed there. It's a very important word. It's only used three times 
in the New Testament, all by Paul. It means to be trapped because of a delusion, a delusion in your mind. What's it saying there? Something significant. You cannot be tempted by anything that doesn't have a piece of it already inside of you. Okay. For example, you have had today or recently or ever any major temptation or test to go gambling. You're not a gambling person. Okay. I'm not either. So I never receive from demons any testing involving gambling. I don't get any temptations to buy lottery tickets. I don't get any temptations to go to a casino over in Scottsdale. Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because I don't have any gambling inside of me to be enticed, drug out of me by temptation. It drags it out of you. Okay? Drags it out of you. If you don't have any of that in you, remember, Jesus told the disciples, the prince of darkness is coming for me tonight. The ruler of this world. He's coming for me. But he has nothing in me. He has nothing in me to drag out of me. See? So the devil hit Jesus with every conceivable temptation you could possibly imagine. He sent him every, every Jewish hot babe in Palestine. He paraded these women in. Nothing. He sent him every opportunity to become a ruler and a king. No response. He sent him every opportunity to become fabulously wealthy. Nothing. He was tempted in all points like we are, emotionally, mentally, physically, sexually, everything. Everything we have been tested with, he was tested. Then it says, yet without sin. Translation, there wasn't any of that in him for the devil to drag out of him. So when you're tempted by something, the devil is looking inside of you and he's saying to himself, hey, there's a little piece of lust, bitterness, anger, something in this person. Let's tempt them to get that to come out of them because we know it's in there. The devil is like a hunter. He's like a hunter. And does he go pheasant hunting in the woods? No, he goes human hunting in the human soul and in the human mind. He is looking inside of you. And if he sees something inside of you, he will send you a test or a temptation to drag that out of you. Okay, this is the root of temptation. It never comes from God. It always comes from demons and Satan. Right? So if he looks inside you and he sees anger in your soul, he will send you a test. Somebody you have problems with, your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, your spouse, your kids, your supervisor, your work, something. Why? He spotted something in you. See? If you have lust, in you, he will parade lustful temptations toward you, usually pornography. An old girlfriend or old boyfriend, something will pop up, something will suddenly materialize, and boom, he comes in. Why is he doing that? Because he's smart. The devil is uh, the world's greatest psychiatrist. He looks you over, he scans you. Remember that movie, The Terminator, that came out, what was that, in the 80s? 
with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He beams down from the future and he's in a parking lot, stark naked, and he walks into a bar. And then the camera goes from inside his head to looking out at the people in the bar and he's scanning the people. The machine is scanning the people. He's trying to find somebody with his that's about the same size as him so he can put clothes on. Remember that? Well, that's exactly what Satan does. He scans you just like Arnold did, the Terminator did in the bar scene at the beginning of the movie. He scans you, but he's not looking for your clothes and if they fit him, he's looking for some kind of sin, even a speck of it, in your soul or in your mind. Then he says, oh, I found this. See, he's a treasure hunter, right? Treasure hunters. They're extremely motivated to hunt for treasures. Archaeologists are highly motivated people hunting for ancient artifacts. And when they find them, they get extremely excited. That's exactly what the devil does. He look, he scans you through. He founds, finds that little thing. And then he tries to drag it out of you through temptation. So that's what that's what this text is saying. They are drawn away, exalco, drag of their own lust, not somebody else's lust, but their lust that's already in here. Now you say, Brother Mike, I've already gone through deliverance 500 times and most of my lust is gone. Praise God for that, and you did a good job. But that little bit that's left, he'll scan you and find it. And then he will focus on it by trying to drag it out of you through exposing you to things that will cause it to manifest. He scans you to see if there's anger in your soul. And then he will give you, tempt you, test you, with things that trigger that anger and cause it to manifest. If he scans you and sees you don't have any certain type of sin in there or wound in there, okay, if he scans you and finds out that you are not attracted at all to gambling, you have no absolute desire to murder anyone, he eliminates those temptations. You don't get them. You're not going to get those temptations. Because there's nothing to drag out of you. It's not there. Verse 15. Then when lust has conceived. When lust conceives. It brings forth. Sin. And sin. When it is finished, brings forth death. What insight is God giving you right now? Well, he's teaching you to become a Holy Ghost auditor. See? And I don't mean to use the word auditor in the same sense that Scientologists use it. Scientology is a satanic cult. Auditing yourself, examining yourself. Paul said, let every man examine themselves to see whether they be in the faith. You are to be a self-analyzer, a self-auditor. What are you looking for? Fruits of the Spirit? And lusts of the flesh. You're analyzing yourself to see, uh oh, what just manifested? Oh, my brother came in and started bossing me around. Okay. I was standing in line yesterday, and uh, my daughter Tracy, my best girl, and I were out. We were going to have lunch together. And so we went to the Arrowhead Mall, and we were going to have Panda Express. 
I was standing in line at Panda Express, and it's the only line that's long in the whole food court. None of the other places uh, have long lines for their food. I don't know how they survive. A lot of them don't. Well, I'm standing in line there, and in front of me is a young couple, good-looking couple. He's about, he's 6'1", 6'2", my height, and uh, his girlfriend's there. She's she's cute. They look like they're about, what, 19 years old, 20 maybe, or something like that. Well, she has a cell phone in her hand, and uh, I'm not listening to him. I can't hear him, but they're, she's looking for something. And then he turns to her and he starts giving her instructions. And she, she gets a frown on her face and she goes, looks at him like, what are you doing? You're, you're being, and I heard this, you're being bossy. She, she raised her voice. Stop bossing me around. Well, the demons looked inside this girl and they saw, listen, um, she was raised with a, with a, mother or a father who was bossy and she has a soul wound over being bossed around so let's get her boyfriend to look at her like she's an idiot and needs to be fixed and he'll start bossing her around and she will then respond to that negatively i just saw it yesterday and that's exactly what I was looking right in front of my eyes at a spiritual event occurring between this couple. And then verse 16, uh, James says, look, don't make this mistake. Every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. Now notice he said perfect gift. Did you happen to notice that? Telios is the Greek word. It means complete or perfectly whole, beautiful, without a spot or blemish, perfect, teleos, completely good. The devil also gives gifts, but they're not perfect gifts. They have flaws, okay? I saw a guy on YouTube uh, a couple weeks ago who was standing up on the stage and he was a Christian minister, so to speak, and he was giving people using his gift of knowledge. He claimed to have the gift of knowledge and he would tell people that stood up personal things about their lives. See, that's a gift, but it didn't come from God. It was not a perfect gift because the stuff he was revealing, much of it was not helpful. It was just, look, I can spot something in your life Aren't I interesting? You know, I ought to be David Blaine. God only gives perfect gifts. The devil just gives gifts. And here James says every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variableness. The Greek word for there is Polyege means fickle. He's being fickle about something, vacillating about something. He doesn't do that. He's spot on 100% of the time. No variableness, neither is there any shadow of turning. He doesn't focus this way and then go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I think I'll change my mind. He doesn't do that. He never changes. He doesn't change. So he can be completely trusted. He can be completely trusted by you 100% of the time. The devil cannot be completely trusted by you 0% of the time. Yeah. For, for years, I have counseled people that, have been on, that go to churches on a regular basis, and many of them are on the worship team. You wouldn't believe how many demon-infected people are on worship teams at churches. And demons try to get them on the worship team. They want them there. They don't like the worship. That gets on their nerves. But the underlying plot is they get these demon-infected people on the worship team, and then later on, sin breaks out on the team. Many people have 
powerful demons that are on worship teams in churches. Like you wouldn't even believe it. And on top of that, you wouldn't believe this. I've seen the devil help people improve their musical skills. I've seen him help people sing better, play better. Why? He wants to get them inf infected on the worship team at the church. He gives them gifts, but they're not perfect gifts. Verse 4, Colossians chapter 2, it says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Here's that same Greek word used again, enticing words. Now Paul's using it with the Colossians. That means fake persuasive language. Pithanologia means to say something to somebody and persuade them, kind of like a salesman or a con artist or a Nigerian telemarketer. They give the call. How are you? Uh-oh, red flag. Hang that phone up. It's a Nigerian telemarketer. Don't do that. Don't let anyone beguile you. The Greek word there means to be deluded. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, joyfully beholding your order and your steadfastness and your faith in Christ. What do we learn today? Something important, very important. Your job is to engage in self-analysis, self-auditing. Not like a Scientologist. I mean, you are to check yourself to see if you are in faith. Okay? And you have to do that seven days a week, 365 days a year. And it's easy to do. You know, call it discernment, if you will. Use that term then, discernment. You're analyzing yourself and you're seeing whether you have anything the devil can drag out of you. Bitterness, anger, frustration, lust, pride, arrogance, whatever it is. Whatever it is. He'll drag it out of you. Now, how does this work when, you, when you're infected with demons? It works very easily. It's, it couldn't be any simpler. The demons on inside of your body work with the demons on the outside. The demons on the inside of your body have audited you, and they know what will, to use a counseling term, trigger you. They know what your triggers are. So the demons on the outside simply bring you testing or temptations. Remember, God never does that. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he does not tempt anyone. The demons on the outside are working with the demons on the inside, and they bring you temptations, tests to trigger what's on the inside. The prince of darkness is coming for me, Jesus said, but he has nothing in me. The goal of your ministry and your Christian life is to remove all these trigger centers. They're trigger centers. Have you ever met somebody with OCD? OCD comes in millions of different ranges. It could be a physical thing that you can't stop doing. It could be something you engage in with someone else. It could be a behavior. It could OCD is just all over the place. But OCD is caused by fear demons. And so the demons on the inside analyzed you and they found out what triggers you to do whatever you do. Check the doorknob. Did you shut it? Is it locked? Is it, is it shut? I better check it again. Have I checked it five times? Yes, but I need one more. Check it again. Shall I do it? 
they know how to trigger you to check that doorknob to see if it's locked 10 times. How would they do it? You know, could be anything. A weird noise in the house. Click. Is the door locked? Did I shut the door? Is it? The demons on the inside scan the person. And then they communicate with the demons on the outside. And they set up a system of trigger spots. Boom, 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 boom. Almost like fireworks going off. Now, what person is going to trigger this person? Oh, this friend, this this sibling, this parent. Who is that person? Okay, what's inside that person that we can use to drag it out of them? Oh, yeah, that that brother or sister uh, molested them when they were four. Oh, okay, that's that's what we've got. And we've got fear in there. So let's use the brother or sister and have them say or do something that triggers a spot. What's your what's your goal in life? The Holy Ghost wants to remove all your trigger spots so that there's nothing in you to be dragged out of you because you cannot give something to someone you don't have. Okay. If somebody from Wall Street pulled up my driveway and said, hey, Brother Mike, listen, our company's in big trouble. Can you fork over $10 million in cash? I don't have $10 million in cash. Not even close. So I could not give the guy, you can't give someone what you don't have to give. If you don't, you don't have love, patience, gentleness, meekness, goodness. If you don't have that, you can't give it. Demons have none of those things and they can never give it. But they can give gifts. And they will bless your ministry if they see they can get you into a scandal later. Now, my radio program every morning at 730 on 1010 AM Christian Radio here in Maricopa County. I've been on the radio for 21 years. And I go over these things on the radio all the time. And I get calls from people saying, wow, Brother Mike, that's amazing. I didn't know the devil was manipulating me like that. I got to get rid of these triggers. And that's what God wants to do for you. He wants to remove those things in you. The Holy Spirit didn't need to remove anything from Jesus because there wasn't anything in him sinful. He lived a sinless life. He was not born in sin. He was the only human being other than Adam that wasn't born in sin and Eve. And he never sinned. But he was tempted every single way you and I are. Sex, money, glory, pride. I mean, you name it. He got hit and hit hard. Because in Jesus' life, remember, the devil himself was attacking him. You and I have never had that, quote, luxury. The devil doesn't even know who we are. The demons that follow us around daily know exactly who we are. And they analyzed us from top to bottom. And they know exactly what's in us. But once it's removed, once it's removed, you don't get the temptation anymore. He doesn't doesn't do it anymore. I had major league problems with lust when I first got born again because I was infected with lust demons and I didn't even know it. I didn't know Christians could have demons. That's how ignorant I was. And so I was I always got tempted with lust constantly all the time, tempted. Girls at church, gr- people I meet in business, whatever it was, the devil was always bringing me testing and temptations with lust. Why? Because he analyzed me and saw I had lust in me. 
after that was removed, I stopped getting a parade of naked women in my life. They stopped dancing and floating around and knocking on the door. It was over. Why? Listen, the devil is not stupid. He only does what he thinks is going to work. He will only attack you in areas where he has evidence there's a chance you might respond. That's how he works. Demons are not stupid. They're smarter than we are. They know what, where our weaknesses are. They know what's in us. They know what's been removed from us, so they don't bother to tempt those areas anymore. They're gone. You overcame them. Well done. You're doing great. But, but the stuff that's still in there is what he's digging around for. He knows it's in there. And so he's going to bring those temptations, not the old ones you used to have. Those are gone. They're, they're, they're disappeared because you overcame in that area, right? Of course. Now he's working on the crap that's left. And that's the temptation you're getting from demons. And that's what Paul's, or James is explaining to us. In chapter one is spectacular information. And most people have no idea that uh, this is going on. Most people have no idea how temptation actually works and what is the root of it. The root of it. So if you remove what's in you, the devil will no longer trigger what's in you because it's not there. During the temptation of Christ, the greatest temptation in history, the devil himself came to Jesus. The devil never comes to us. He didn't know who we are and couldn't care less. He came directly to Christ. He tempted him in three areas. What was the result? Nada. Zip. Why? It wasn't in there to drag out. Hey, Yahshua, why don't you jump off this building here and have a great flight down like a skydiver? Just have some fun. Party on, dude. After all, the angels will be down there catching you. It's good. You're good. Let's party. I'll go with you. I'll jump with you and we'll both fly down like, my goodness. Satan. In Deuteronomy, it says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Remember that? The devil kept striking out, man. He was like the San Diego Padres. They just played the Dodgers, right? The Padres. They had the, the series in their hand. They were beating the living crap out of the Dodgers. And then suddenly, for 22 straight innings, San Diego Padres could not score a run and lost the series. 22 innings, they could, <laughs> they could not score a run and came from total victory to crashing defeat. It was the second biggest collapse in the history of Major League Baseball. What happened there? The Dodger pitchers said, hey, the Padres don't have any hits left in them. They did an analysis, and they saw that these guys can't hit anymore. It's mental. Let's strike them out. Let's ground them out. Let's pop fly them out, and we're going to win. And that's exactly what happened. The devil couldn't find anything in Jesus to drag out. The Padres had a bunch of outs in them, and the Dodgers kept dragging outs out of them. Excuse the pun. Be encouraged today because your call from God has never left your life, even though you backslid. It doesn't matter. You backslid, you failed, you screwed up. It does not matter. Sweetheart, listen to me. Dude, listen to me. The call of God is still on your life. 
go for it. Become an auditor. What's still in there? I got rid of all this, but there might be one little thing. I got rid of 50 things, but there might be one or two little things still left in there. Well, if they're in there, the demons audited you. They know they're in there. And so what they'll do, they'll bring temptations directly to that, those two things. They won't do it on the other things anymore. Or if they do, it will be just occasional just to check you. But it won't be a consistent series of temptations. That won't happen. They focus. They, unlike born-again Christian, unlike church people, demons are able to focus. Church people are not. They're scatterbrained. Their minds are all over the place. Nope, not demons. There's the spot. There's the other one. Satan himself said to Jesus, man, you look like, dude, you've lost all the weight. You've been doing a little fasting, have you? I know you're starving. I know you like bread. I, I watched you at your mother and dad's house. I know that you like bread. Look, these stones over here. Look at them. They look like loaves of bread, don't they? Listen, my man, Yahshua, you fasted long enough. You fasted. Here, here, you, you got all kinds of power, right? Uh, you got all kinds of power, right? Not. Why don't you make these stones in the bread? Go ahead. You're the son of God, aren't you? You're supposed to be. You're not. Jesus said, hey, in Deuteronomy, it says, thou shalt, man shall not live by bread alone, but the real bread, real bread, is God's holy word. Oh, the devil struck out again. What happened there? Wasn't anything in there to drag out. He failed again. And then the Bible says Satan left him for a season. For a season. Of course, he came back, obviously. And they eventually murdered him. That was a big oops on his part, but that's a different Bible study. Maybe I'll do that one next Sunday. Be encouraged, my friend, because your call is still there. It's right there. All you got to do is audit yourself and find the triggers. Well, Brother Mike, this seems so simple. I don't understand why I know every Christian isn't doing it. The reason they're not doing it is because they have fear demons and they have insecurities. And people don't like the, the negative emotion from the soul that comes from insecurities. But if you'll overcome that negative emotion and that sense of being inadequate, a failure, a loser, that low self-esteem. If you'll fight through that and get to that trigger and turn that thing over to the Lord and get it removed, like you did all these other triggers, remember all these other things you improved on? You're able to do it. And you know you're able to do it. But if you have coward demons, the Greek word is delia. God has not given us a fear, spirit of cowardice, but of love and power and a sound mind. That's what you have. But if you are, if you have coward spirits, your coward spirits start to panic when you touch an insecurity nerve. When you have a low self-esteem nerve, okay? Right? You, 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 you got a really nice body on you. But your face looks like somebody dug it up. Well, the devil's not going to focus on your body to shame you. He's going to focus on your ugly face. You're going to focus on your body differently. That's a trigger. Pride. Well, you're the opposite. Brother Mike, I'm the opposite. I got a really nice looking face. I'm a good looking guy. Very handsome. But my body, I'm fat, droopy, and stupid looking. They'll just reverse field on you. Whatever trigger they can find in you to cause insecurity is very important to them because insecure people will not face their fears. And the only way you can survive and be an overcomer is if you face your fears. 
singing gospel songs over your assets all day long will not save you. You got to be able to face your fears. Please. Your call from God is yelling at you. Come home, son. Sweetheart, come home. I got your miracles here. You were born to be a killer. And that's what you're going to be. A stone cold killer for God. Yeah, I love you. I'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. Thank you.